Hey folks, the not-so-evil Evil Viking 13 here, and today I'm going to introduce you guys to Empire Total War. I've had a series on my channel for a while featuring the American Road to Independence campaign, and some of you guys have been enjoying that, but not all of you quite get the game. So in this video, I'm going to kind of explain what the game is, how you play it, how you get it, and how to add this amazing Darth mod, which you see here on my main screen. This mod changes the game completely and is a must-have in my opinion. Let's go ahead and start with the basics. What is Empire Total War? Well, Empire is one of the latest in a series of Total War games by uh, Creative Assembly, based out of the UK. These games feature a uh, global campaign system, kind of like a Risk game board, if you guys have ever played the, the board game Risk, and then actual real-time battles that you fight out with just tons and tons of units. I love the time period, and I love history, so this game just kind of fits with me, but let's go ahead and dive into the meat of the game. Uh, that would be the Grand Campaign. In the Grand Campaign, you pick a nation, you can read about their religions and uh, the regions that they own and, and their enemies and their friends and as you can see right here we're gonna start in the year 1700 and we can kinda crank the difficulty up just a bit there and we're gonna take off advisor help because I do know how to play the game I've been playing this since 2009 I've got like 400 some hours I absolutely love this game so here we have our victory conditions down in the lower left hand corner and you can actually go through and change these we're doing a short campaign. We have uh, 50 years, which is actually uh, 100 turns. Each turn is half a year to take over 20 extra regions. And they have to include the regions listed here. And these listed regions do change based on which country you're playing as. So seeing we're playing as Russia, we have to own uh, Livonia, Georgia, Sweden, and uh, it goes on from there. Whereas if we play as, say, Sweden, we have to own uh, Norway, Poland, and obviously Sweden. <laughs> Let's see, Long Campaign. This requires 30 regions held by the year 1799, so that's uh, almost 100 years there. Prestige Victory requires... Ah, uh, here we go. It's all of the previous conditions, all those regions as well as having the highest prestige rating at the end of the year. And to get good prestige, you have to have good technology. Your country has to be advanced, it has to be well educated, your leaders have to be well respected, and you have to have a large army and a large navy and plenty of income, and uh, a whole bunch of that goes into that prestige score. And finally, we have the very obvious world domination win condition, which is capture and hold 40 regions by the end of the year 1799 and uh, 40 regions will include a good chunk of the world. After going over that, let's just go ahead and dive right into the world map. Let's see what this game is all about. Once you start a campaign, the camera kind of pans around showing your territory and your advisor uh, carries on in the background and gives you an overview of, of your empire here and what, what you have to watch out for, uh, who you're currently at war with, who you might be at war with soon, who your likely friends might be. We're gonna go ahead and just skip all that. You guys can see it for yourself if you play your own campaign. Here we are playing as Russia. The green territory is our nation. We own quite a few regions here. Not a bad chunk of territory, but as you can see, our regions are really, really empty and spread out. We have long, winding roads and uh, some very spread out settlements. It's going to be very hard to defend these large regions. Now inside of your regions you do have capital cities and this capital right here, Moscow, is not only the capital of uh, this region of Muscovy, if I'm saying that correctly. I'm sure you guys will let me know if I'm not. This is also the capital of our nation. A very important area to hold. Every city and region has stats to go with it. Let's go ahead and take a look. Double click on that. We can see our classes here under the public order section. We have uh, upper class and lower class. See, we are a monarchy. And we can kind of see how happy they are. And as you can see, the upper class is very happy because they like the monarchy. Things are good for the upper class under the monarchy. Things that are uh, making them quite happy include garrison forces in the city. Makes everyone kind of watch their words. We have some militia and some uh, demi cannons here occupying the city, keeping order. Government buildings. We have a 
barracks, a governor's mansion, and that mansion especially is going to help with the repression of the populace in the region. Government type repression, 12. We are a monarchy. Our monarch is... Wow, I have no idea how to say that. Um, Peter the first, perhaps? Uh, we'll go with that. And he is the absolute monarch. He is the ultimate authority. And the upper class definitely like that. In addition, we have a few smaller traits that are helping out our upper class's uh, disposition, including people in government, and just once again that government type, which is the monarchy. For the lower classes, they're not quite as happy, but they are under control. They do fear the government, the, the monarchy here, and that kind of helps with the repression. They also have some entertainment and culture bonus points, and that's from this little uh, coaching inn over here in this smaller town. That's adding uh, plus two happiness to the lower classes. It's a very large public house with rooms for weary travelers. And I'm sure there's a bar in there somewhere. <laughs> Moving on from the population information, you guys can definitely see that this is a very uh, deep and interconnected game. There's a lot of things to keep track of, but once you get it all down, it does come uh, pretty quick and you don't have to watch all of this like a hawk most of the time. You can see that we have our tax rates here, 30% in this region, and that will affect growth. So if you tax too much, you're going to hurt the growth of your, of your regions. And growth is important because the more people that you have in the region, the more money that the region makes. So if you overtax early on, trying to get extra money, you're going to hurt the growth and hurt your long-term profits. In addition, you see there's a small little village right here. Uh, this village which is owned by Sweden, so we actually can't control any of this. Uh, this village will not become a town where you can actually build a building until the population reaches a certain point. And uh, as you can see down here on the lower left, because of the high taxes right now, villages are not growing. They're also uh, starving. They don't have enough farms. And that, combined with that tax burden, is just really killing the population growth. And Really early on, you're going to want to lower your taxes as much as possible and get these towns growing because there's another one over here where you'll be able to build a dock later on, but you just you have to let your towns grow until you can actually build at them. And uh, taxing early on is a definite way to hurt that. Going back to some of my territories, let's find another capital. Here we go. Kiev, Ukraine, and we can also see our religion down here. The population of the Ukraine down here in this region is 80% Orthodox and 20% Catholic. And that is very important for the happiness of the population. Now I mentioned starvation earlier, and one way to prevent starvation in your regions is to build plenty of farms in your smaller towns. The uh, more improvements that you upgrade with your farms, the better that they get, and the less chance of starvation that you have with your population. How do you upgrade your farms using new technology? Well, that is under research and technology, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now that we've covered most of what's in the region panel, let's talk about your government panel. It's right here. As we saw earlier, we have an absolute monarchy. We are Orthodox in our state religion. Our capital is Moscow. Our current treasury is 37,500. We are pretty affluent. And we have a prestige rank of Majestic. And we can also see our taxes, our trade income, other income, as well as the cost of our current armies, and our uh, current cost of navies, town watches, and all that, giving us a total income after we end our turn of about 5,000. We can see our allies, which include Poland and uh, Denmark right now. And we're already at war with four countries, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Crimean uh, Conte, the Barbary States, and of course the Dirty Pirates. We are also trading with one of our allies, which is Poland. And we have no protectorates, which are kind of uh, countries that you don't directly own, but you basically control in exchange for protecting them against attack. Under our policy tabs, we can see 
our overall taxation and if we just go nuts with our taxes eventually we're going to make our population very very angry what happens when your population is angry well let's look um, here we go in the region of uh, Komai our lower classes are angry which means after we end our turn and uh, let it go through once they're actually going to uh, riot and some people will get killed and they might actually burn a building down now after a couple of turns of the population being very unhappy perhaps because of these high taxes here they will actually form a rebel army and they will march against your own government forces in an attempt to actually overthrow the government and if they succeed the region that rebelled will actually become its own nation and you'll have to fight that nation and reclaim it to bring it back underneath your banners on a side note if you have multiple regions say if we own some colonies in the Americas you would actually be able to then edit the taxes for that region uh, of the world separately however in this time period here in 1700 Russia does not own any territories in North America going back to Europe let's take a look at our ministers we have our absolute monarch he has an average management skill, nothing too exciting about that. He does have some traits, including the rather clever trait. This man's wits are his birthright. And that adds uh, some percentage points to our technology research rate. And a fascination with foreigners, which actually adds 10% uh, to our uh, diplomatic relations. That's not bad at all. Naval Enthusiast takes off 5% for recruitment for naval units. And we have the Enlightened Despot perk right here, and that uh, that adds negative 5% to the cost of town watches, which are basically extra troops that keep your population under control. Now because we have an absolute monarch, we can't just uh, get rid of him, but we can see his family tree. We'll see his children as our game progresses and see who owns the throne. We do have, as an absolute monarch, complete control over our cabinet. Our treasurer, for instance, is kind of an idiot. Uh, negative 4 bonus to global tax income, negative 15% growth stuff, it's just all kinds of just terribleness. So we can actually kick him and he'll be replaced with one of the candidates from down here so that took him from a two star and his replacement is a three star no real bonuses but at least he doesn't suck before we leave our ministers tab we can also see the average popularity of our government which is sitting at about 55 percent not great but it is improving uh, lowering taxes uh, victories in battle expanding your technology all of these things will increase your government's popularity finally let's look at the trade tab we do have a world market where you can see the value in gold of each load of uh, different things including coffee cotton furs ivory we do have some furs that we're actually gathering let's find one of our fur trapping posts up here here's one right here and we can see that we're getting 22 fur pelts produced each turn and we are trading those over land with Poland we're trading basically all of those furs all 1276 are going to Poland and we have some miscellaneous other goods that are produced by our towns I believe and if we look really closely somewhere around here we can actually see there's one of the wagons these wagons actually trace the trade routes in between your uh, own trade buildings and whoever you're trading with. So this wagon will actually go all the way to our border with Poland and truck on over there. So that is the trade screen. Very important to actually keep an eye on this and make sure that your trade routes aren't blocked or uh, not working for some reason because a lot of your money will come from trade agreements with other nations. Most of the time you're going to want to have a good trade agreement with multiple nations in order to actually have a good economy. 
So, speaking of other nations, let's talk about diplomacy. Let's open up our Diplomatic Relations tab. That is a lot of countries. Now, these are just the major nations. We also have minor nations, and I think the Darth Mod actually adds a few of these, or perhaps just changes their flags. I'm not entirely sure. Either way, that's a lot of nations. Let's, uh, let's just walk through some of our possible negotiations we could have. Now, we can see that we're currently at war with the Ottoman Empire. The cross swords there. We can see if we select them, their territories are highlighted on the map. Right there in white. And uh, their allies are actually highlighted in green. And our territories in Russia are bright red, showing that not only are we at war, but we are quite hated. Let's look at ourselves. If we click on our own country here, Russia, now we're in white. You can see that the Ottoman Empire is very hated and we are at war with them. However, we are quite friendly with both uh, Poland and uh, Great Britain and Denmark. And Sweden, well, we're not at war, but they don't quite love us thanks to Let's see, if we hover over it, ah, we are disliked by Sweden because of an alliance with an enemy nation. Uh, we have war declared on a friend, which must mean that Sweden is friends with the Ottoman Empire. We do have a plus 15 because we have the same government type, which is an absolute monarchy. And our national leaders command respect, which is another plus 10. That only brings us to negative 55 though. That is quite painful as far as alliances go. Okay, let's open negotiations. And they're a bit rude. Uh, <laughs> they start out with, our noble sovereign will hear of your unworthy petition. Speak that your proposal can be considered. Trade agreement. Can we offer them technology? No, we're, we're at about the same as far as technology goes. Can we pay them off? Let's offer them 3,000 gold for a trade agreement. This will probably not work. We can also see here in the diplomacy panel that public opinion towards them on our hand is hostile and their population is also unfriendly towards us. We have laid out our offer as well as our demand trade agreement and we're offering that 3000 gold. Now we can threaten them, which implies we're going to attack you if you don't comply. We can uh, clear the offer out and start over again. Or we can just go ahead and send the offer as is. Let's send it. And they have actually agreed. They say, Do not presume that this agreement has dampened down the fires of our dislike for your nation, sir. Good day. Alright, fine, be rude. Either way, we're actually now trading with Sweden. On note about trade agreements, there are actually some prerequisites to them. You must either be neighboring the nation that you want to trade with. So our trade is actually going right over the border from our Muscovy region to Ingria, which is owned by Sweden. There's our trade route right there. Trade can also go over sea if you have a trade port, and I don't think we do, not yet at least. Uh, once you have a good trade port on one of your shores, that actually opens up a lot of trade options with nations that are much farther away. The downside of a nice long trade route over the ocean is the fact that your enemies can raid it, taking part of your profits. And uh, that means you have to protect your trade routes with your navies. You want to try and trade with as many nations as possible to get the maximum income coming into your nation. Regardless, those are the basics of the diplomacy screen. Next up, we have research and technology. To actually advance your nation, you have to have a college, at least a school. And we have one in Nizhny, probably butchering that name as well. There it is. And as you advance in your campaign, you're actually gonna be able to upgrade this small school to a college and then a university and then a classical university, and it'll just keep going from there. And if you look right here on our technology tree, I can go ahead and get them started on researching plug bayonets. 
Once you do have a completed school, you can assign it technology to research. Right here you can see we can research plug bayonets for our infantry. It will take four turns to research at the current level of just the simple school. And now it is researching. Besides the military technologies, we also have industrial technologies and philosophy, which will advance our government. Some of these technologies do come with negative effects. For example, government by consent. This increases our technology research rate, but does add to clamor for reform, which makes the lower classes unhappy. And finally, if you look at the lower right hand side of the screen here, there are a few menus to actually help you navigate your empire. The building browser will show you the current buildings in the region that you have selected and their level. In this case, this magistrate is a very low level government building and has a long way to go to be upgraded all the way. We also have our lists, which simply list out the location of our armies, the name of their general, their troop strength, how much movement they have. If you see, I'll move this army right here. He is going to use up move points. I'm going to fast forward with the spacebar. He has moved almost all that he can for this turn. We can also see fleets, of which we have none. <laughs> poor, poor Russia. You can also see our regions. This is a nice little overview right here to show basically a quick glance at your empire. You can see all your taxes, your happiness, your population, which ones are growing, which ones are decreasing in population. And finally, let's talk about agents. In Empire Total War, you have a number of agents that will help you out as you look to expand or defend your empire. The first type are gentlemen. Now these are, well, gentlemen. Their main purpose is to help with research. They can also duel and defeat other gentlemen. There's our duel button right there. This gentleman is Ivan Motorin. Motorin? Yeah, that guy. He is uh, rank 3 stars here. He is a manufacturing owner, which increases his research for industrial technologies by 2. We had some uh, military stuff going on with our research. Let's just change that real quick. And we're going to change it to industrial. Let's see. Common land enclosures. We'll have them research that. Now that will take five turns, but let's see what happens when we put our gentleman inside of the school. Aha! Two turns removed from the research rate. That's a huge boost. By carefully comparing your gentleman's stats and arraying them in the correct schools, you can greatly increase your empire's technology research rate and really get ahead in your prestige. Now that we know what gentlemen are for, let's talk about missionaries. Now these are pretty self-explanatory. If you build churches, uh, synagogues, mosques, any kind of religious buildings uh, according to your government's religion inside of a region, they have a random chance of actually generating one of these missionaries. In this case, we have Stephen who is an orthodox missionary and while inside of a region, depending on his rank, he will actually convert the populace to his assigned religion. Now this region is 100% orthodox already, so he will not do any converting here. So what are missionaries really for? Well, one thing that I use them for is for scouting, because they are essentially neutral units. Um, only a rake, which we'll talk about next, can assassinate them. And they can kind of just wander freely across country borders with no real consequences. Also, once they enter a region that has a religion that is not the same as theirs, if they're high enough ranked, and if that region does not have very many um, other churches of their religion to counteract your missionary, he will begin to convert the populace. And eventually, if he does convert the population over to the missionary's religion, and if that missionary's religion that he has converted the population to is not in alignment with the government's religion, it will cause a lot of unrest among the lower classes, and eventually it could cause one of those rebellions just by the religious unrest, which can really multiply if the, uh, the region is kind of low-tech, low-income, and uh, not well defended. So basically, sending your missionaries in is just kind of a sneaky way to both scout and kind of cause some trouble behind enemy lines. Now I mentioned rakes, that is our last type of agent. Rakes are basically 
cell swords. They are hired swords and uh, vagabonds. They are ruffians. They are trouble. And they actually have the most possible uses, but they are also the easiest to, to lose. Now, a rake can, of course, scout like the rest of the agents. He can either assassinate another agent, including missionaries, or he can actually sabotage enemy buildings and towns and cause destruction. For instance, so if I were to use a rake to sabotage this coaching inn, it would destroy the building and remove that bonus of the plus two happiness for that country's lower classes. It would also cost that country a certain amount of coin to then repair that building to maximum strength. Now, you are not guaranteed a sabotage, it is a, a kind of behind the scenes dice roll. The more sabotage that your agent is successful at, the better he gets at it and the more he's able to do. Eventually you could have a guy running around behind enemy lines, blowing up harbors and military facilities and just causing a ton of havoc behind enemy lines. And there is of course a danger to this, if you fail at your sabotage or fail your assassination, other countries find out about it, and you definitely lose some points on the diplomatic uh, area of things. No one really likes to hear that their neighbor has an assassin trucking around in their other neighbor. That is generally frowned upon. It's not very gentlemanlike. So those are our three agents. The gentlemen, which can duel and assist with technology. And we have our missionaries, which convert the masses. And our rakes, which get into all kinds of trouble. We have just one final thing to look at, and that is our objectives and our prestige. Now, seeing this is the long campaign, we have our 40 regions suggested here, along with uh, two that we have to own. We already own one of them, Muscovy, and we must own Ingria up here as well, which means we have to at some point go to war with Sweden, as it is one of our victory conditions. Putting our objectives aside, let's look at our prestige tab. This shows your relationship with the other nations of the world. And as you can see, Great Britain is definitely the empire to beat in this time period. Uh, they have a massive military, the largest navy in the world, excellent economics and industry, and good enlightenment as well. Whereas Russia has an average military, no navy, no enlightenment, and no true modern economy. So we have a lot of catching up to do as Russia. And that's what's really cool about this game is, as you play as each different country, each one has its unique statistics and abilities and strengths and weaknesses and uh, even histories. And so every country plays differently. You have different things to overcome. And this game has a lot of replay value, a, a terrifying amount of replay value, actually. One final note on towns. Let's take a look at this one right here. Here in Kiev, you can see your individual buildings in the capital right here. I currently have just the army encampment, which means I can only train one unit per turn. If I eventually upgrade to a larger uh, military barracks, not this low level barracks, but the actual military one, I can then recruit more military units per turn, as well as a larger variety of these units. You can see right here on the recruitment tab. I have a decent range of infantry, but these are all very low old tech units. We have mounted archers, I kid you not, as well as um, some basic cavalry and some uh, some basic artillery that actually can't move around a whole lot, and some sword armed militia and musket men, just very basic stuff, and we're going to want to keep upgrading those those buildings for sure. Here on the Infrastructure tab, we can also upgrade our roads. This will increase our movement within our region. We currently have just basic dirt roads. Going to cobbled roads will mean that we can actually truck down the road at a much higher speed with our armies. This can be a huge, huge deal if your regions get attacked maybe on the side of your, of your empire that's opposite of your armies and you have to march across your own territory. You want to be able to do that quickly. And of course, besides all of your military and infrastructure upgrades, you have some other government buildings you can upgrade. These will increase uh, tax bonuses, increase research points, and uh, of course add to repression to keep your population under control. And eventually you'll actually have some side buildings you can build on some of these larger capitals. For example, this conservatorium. 
basically just increases the population's happiness at just a straight price of gold. And of course it does add uh, one gold per turn to town wealth in this region. Going back to our region menu right here, each turn that our region continues to actually grow, its value does increase, giving you more tax revenue. The more money that your people make in their regions, the more money that you get out of it. So you want to encourage region growth and population growth wherever possible. And finally, on the end here, you can see that we can actually, for a very expensive amount of money, 12,000 gold, add fortifications. And this does have a few different uh, levels. Some regions, like in North America, will start with a wooden fort, which is pretty cheap. This fort, however, starts out at the massive uh, Star Fort, I believe, which has huge walls, battlements, cannons, and it's just absolutely massive, which is why it's so expensive. A city that has a fort upgraded right there, when an army attacks it, instead of just marching out onto a battlefield, the attacking army has to attack the fort instead, allowing your forces a huge advantage if a bit of a frustrating fight thanks to the weird and wonky AI pathfinding on forts. Before we actually head into the real-time area of things, just a few more menu things to talk about. Over here on the region menu we can actually click around just like most games and see all of our different regions around the world. We can zoom in and out for detail. And besides just looking around Europe we can of course go to the Americas what's up guys as well as India let's talk about trade regions there are four trade regions in the world including the coast of Brazil the Ivory Coast and it goes on across these regions can only be accessed by navies you want to actually build a harbor and then create trade ships and send them out across the ocean and put them on these little ship icons with the anchor right here once your trade ships are on this position, they will automatically every turn send back goods. It's different goods depending on which coast you're looking at. Brazil, I believe, has a lot of sugar. The Ivory Coast has, believe it or not, ivory. And you can actually look at the values of those in the current world market. Keep in mind, though, that your enemies, who will also have navies, can come for your ships in these trade regions. These are not war-free zones. So, you know, you might have your little trade fleet just hanging out down here, getting some nice income, and uh, you kind of forget you're at war with Great Britain with their awesome navy, and all of a sudden they have a navy full of third rates sinking your trade, uh, your trade fleet down there, and all of a sudden there goes all of your income, you're broke, your empire is crumbling, aren't you a terrible player? <laughs> so if you do use those trade regions, and I think you really, really need to to get that extra income, be aware that you do have to spend money on some ships to protect them. Oh, and of course, there are dirty, dirty pirates. Where is their home base? Ah, the Leeward Islands. Uh, the pirates have a surprisingly strong naval presence. Not just an occasional pirate ship, but an actual, like, hardcore navy. So. You do have to watch out for pirates, even if you're at war with no other nation. You will always be at war with the pirates, because they are terrible, terrible scallywags.